Ladies and gentlemen, we bring you now a special report by Governor Nelson A. Rockefeller. Tonight, the governor will discuss the McHugh Report, Survival in a Nuclear Attack. Governor Rockefeller. Hello, friends. I suppose the thing closest to the heart of each one of us is the safety of our homes, our family, our children. We as a people have a deep belief in the value of the individual growing out of our religious and heritage that we have as a nation. And that's why we pray and work for peace as our basic objective as a nation. But in the subconscious, perhaps you might say, of each one of us, deep down in our hearts, we do have a real fear about the possibility of nuclear war, even if it's by a mistake, an accident, a miscalculation that someone might make on the other side, because the Soviets now do have the capacity to deliver a devastating nuclear attack on our country. I share this feeling of concern, and as your governor, I have a tremendous responsibility for your safety and security and for that of the 16 and a half million people of this state. Because of that, I've had two studies made of this problem, nuclear attack and particularly the fallout aspect, the dangers, the results of fallout to the people of our state, to the people of our country. The second report is made, as was just mentioned by the announcer, by Keith McHugh, who's Commissioner of Commerce with a departmental study group in the state government, working with federal people in the various military and civilian groups. Now, Keith McHugh has come here tonight to talk with us about this report that was issued last week. And I'd like to ask him some questions about it. What is fallout? Why is it dangerous? What can we do about it to get protection? And what kind of a program should we have in this state? Now, we discussed this at a White House conference where the president invited various of the governors down. We discussed it at the governor's conference in Puerto Rico last year. And the facts are well known today. The problem is now manageable. The time has come for action. Keith, I'd like to welcome you here this, this evening and to thank you very much for coming over and what you've done in, in this tremendous study which you and your associates have worked out. And I'd like to ask you a few questions about the report for the benefit of all of the people here in the state who are concerned and interested tremendously so in this question. Could you tell us a little about what this, what fallout really is? Because I think that's essential that we know that. Governor, uh, when you drop a nuclear bomb close to the surface, you get this tremendous explosion and this fireball that we've just seen. It gouges out an enormous hole in the surface of the earth a mile wide, perhaps, and 200 feet deep, and carries all that material up 20, 25,000 feet. How does it lift that material up? Lifts it up through the force of the vacuum created by the explosion. That, in turn, results in millions of small particles, which become intensely radioactive from the effect of the weapon, and those, depending on the wind conditions, descend back to the surface of the earth or our homes or our houses. That's fallout. Well, now, why are these particles that you say radioactive particles, why are they dangerous? Exceedingly dangerous because every one of those little particles emits what are called gamma rays. Each one acts like a small radio, but deadly radio transmitter, sending out these rays in all directions. Is it like an X-ray machine? Like an X-ray machine, only far more deadly and more powerful. And we'll put these rays will penetrate the body easily, and uh, they'll do us very great damage. Well, can they, can they kill people? They will first make us sick, and then they will make us die if we get too much of them, Governor. Well, now, uh, Keith, how, can, how, can, uh, how did you find in this report that the people could protect themselves against this? There's only one way in which you can protect yourself against these rays, and that is by weight or mass of material only thing known to the scientists that will suffice in order to keep this thing from doing you such great harm that you will die from it. But if you interpose enough materials between you and the rays, you can survive. 
So these, this radioactive material comes down sort of like dust coming out of the, out of the cloud. Precisely. And then each one of these little particles of dust is like an uh, X-ray machine. And these rays, if you get enough of them, exposure will kill you. That's right. But you can get behind but some... But you can get behind mass of materials... Yeah. They will blunt the rays enough so that you can survive and can survive very well indeed if you're protected properly. Well, now, is this if there was an all-out attack, for instance, on the United States due to some error in judgment or, or some purposeful uh, attack on the part of uh, the Soviet, which has this capability today, what would, liable to, what would be liable to happen in this country? Would it hit just in a few places? Would the rest of the people be safe, or how would it work out? Well, there are various theories, Governor, about what kind of an attack pattern uh, an enemy might use on us, but I have a chart here I'd like to show you, which was used as an attack pattern by a congressional committee, which went into this uh, matter very carefully last year. And the attack pattern shown by those dots is a drop uh, of, a, of a nuclear weapon. And each each of one those, of these is a bomb. Each one is a bomb. You'll notice that there are two or three here in New York State. Uh, but the important thing about this, I'm going to show you on this next chart, Governor. Well, pardon me, before you do, Keith, does, does, the, does the Soviet Union have the capacity today uh, to deliver partly by manned bombers and partly by uh, the missiles they've got, the short-range missiles from submarine, bombs that could fall all over the United States? I think there's still an argument about how many missiles they have, Governor, but... Uh, uh, I think there's no one seriously questions uh, their capability of a massive attack on the United States, so whether this it would be this particular pattern or not. Uh, so this is a realistic know. danger that we face as of now. That's correct. Well, then let's take uh, a look at what happens when... Now, we're after falling. those bombs drop and this, these bursts have gone up, yeah. this has taken 24 hours, Governor, after the bomb drop. And with the prevailing westerly winds which we have here in the United States, the fallout that I speak of has carried that, uh, those particles across the United States there from some cases for many hundreds of miles. But you'll notice the serious and important thing is that in our own state of New York here, mm. we are blanketed by fallout. This is a typical weather condition for a typical attack pattern. So you country. mean this, uh, this cloud goes up with the dust, the wind carries it, and can that carry 100 miles or more? It may easily carry several hundred miles. Several hundred miles, and that's how even if there were only three bombs fell on New York State, it could cover the whole state with this fallout. That's correct, sir. Well, then that becomes a, a, a tremendously serious uh, question. And if we didn't have protection uh, as citizens, which frankly we don't have today, uh, very few indeed, uh, could that could that either make sick or kill most of the people in our state? Governor, if we do a proper job on this, we can save all those persons who escape the effect of the blast and the fire. And that could run into millions. In our own state, it could run, we estimate on any probable attack pattern that it could save between 8 and 15 million people in our state of New York alone. Mm. For the 8 country, or 15 million who's other, who otherwise who would either would be, be killed? Who to die as a result of radioactivity and exposure to radioactive fallout. So if there were only three bombs fell on New York and the people who were under the bombs would be killed, uh, the rest of the people who were not in the immediate heat or blast area uh, could be saved if they had protection from had this radio fallout, radioactive fallout, which comes across the country uh, from other areas. If they had proper shielding, they could be saved from, that, from the effect of that. Well, that's a tremendous uh, thing that you've developed in this, Keith. I think we ought to talk a little bit about uh, how much warning do you have on that. Uh, in other words, how long does it take those uh, on this chart here? How long does it take this to come across here? Uh, there's a lot of public misconception, Governor, about this warning thing. We normally think about warning as the warning before the missile. Yeah. And that's spoken of now in terms of 15 to 30 minutes. Uh, we have another type of warning time in this case. If you are outside the blast area, we think, and the scientists, the great scientists of the country agree with this, that we have uh, an hour's minimum warning time for 
practical working purposes. You mean this? To is get a, into a shelter where we can be protected. After that dust is sucked way up, it goes way up how many? 30,000 right. feet? 20, 25,000 feet. 25, and it takes a time for it to cool and solidify and to begin to descend. To and to get back to the Earth's surface. So that, even if you were five miles away from hour. bomb, it would, take, it would take an hour for that fallout to come yes, down. Yes, sir. We think well, it would be close to This is a hour. very important factor in, in, in and developing. And gives a new concept in the development of this thing because now we have some opportunity to get some to some place of safety before. Well, Keith, another goes. another very important question then that's in I know everybody's mind is how long does this fallout? Uh, how long can it uh, does it keep emitting these rays? Well, uh, the uh, The fallout itself, uh, Governor, uh, uh, fortunately for us, attenuates very rapidly with time. That is, it decreases in its intensity with time with great rapidity. Uh, roughly, you can figure this, that for any given initial intensity right after the burst, yeah. that that has decreased to uh, one-tenth of that intensity in seven hours. I have a chart here yeah. which shows that. Oh, good. Uh, to about 1% uh, of the intensity uh, after 48 hours and after two weeks to about one-tenth of 1% 1 of its original uh, intensity. The only way in which you can protect yourself against this, I've shown a typical house here just yeah. for instance. The average house build is maybe very comfortable and sound from a weather standpoint and comfort and everything else, but it's not a very good protection medium uh, against radioactive fallout. You mean this radioactivity comes right it through comes the walls? right through the walls, it deposits on the roof, it comes down through the roof of the house uh, and will do great damage because the protection factor is exceedingly small in the average uh, home. However, I've shown here uh, what you can do to save yourself in this picture by interposing masses of material at the corner in the basement uh, and you get in there and you yeah. stay for a while you have your necessary supplies and food and water uh, that cuts down the effect of these rays the dangerous effect on your blood and on your on the cells of your body so that you can survive that uh, very nicely it's especially important in view of this, therefore, that you be well protected during the early part of this period because, as I've explained, the intensity does go off rather rapidly with time. But these initial intensities are so great that if you're exposed just a few moments, perhaps mm -hmm. even to them... Uh, at the beginning, when at it first the beginning, comes. Uh, you can become very sick if you do not die. Well, now, Keith, am I right in, in understanding that this... Uh, there's these rays, when they come into your body, that they actually disintegrate the cells of your body. That's and that right. you can take a little bit because then the blood will rebuild those cells. That's but if you right. get too much, the blood can't uh, rebuild can, those and it just actually... You can take a fair amount of if it's over a considerable period of time. But if you take mm -hmm. a lot of it fast, Governor, it's very dangerous indeed. And so that it can result in death. That's right. Well, now, if you get into a cell that's got this extra protection, What's this dirt uh, piled up over well, here Well, the for? dirt here is to give a little extra protection yeah. at this point, Governor, so that fallout on the ground would not come through and attack that. Earth. Where, where your house is above the That's uh, right, where uh, part cellar, of your base, of the basement is, is above there. ground. Yeah. Actually, I'll show you in a moment another shelter where we've been very careful to keep the top of the shelter at the ground level, and that produces another idea, per, but perhaps a little bit early in the story at the moment. Well, I, I, think, I, I think that everybody would be tremendously interested to know about the shelter plans that you've developed in this. In other words, you say the individual can be protected if he has shelter. Now, let's, let's well, talk a little bit about the kinds of shelters that one might build and, and, and how expensive they are. We had the advantage in this study, uh, Governor, of a, uh, the uh, uh, staff uh, and uh, knowledge of one of the great architectural firms in the country that uh, under a grant from the Ford Foundation, and we've made, uh, or more accurately, they've made an exhaustive study of uh, all the science and literature in this whole picture. Uh, we know now uh, how to build uh, shelters from uh, small, compact shelters to uh, as elaborate as you please. And we fortunately, we think, have found a way to build some shelters very inexpensively indeed. So well, if we the couldn't, cost, uh, then the people couldn't build them because nobody right. could afford to. 
And very now beautiful. this is a a room type shelter mm -hmm. with a baffle wall, uh, perfectly safe and sound for this two week period. And this generally, is in the cellar. This is in the cellar yeah. and generally quite comfortable during that uh, time. Uh, what? It, well, let me ask you about this, Keith. You you come in here. You don't seem to have a door on. No, we don't need a door on it if you're careful to build a baffle out in front so that the gamma rays cannot come in through the side. They can't, the go around the, they can't go around the corner. No, they won't go around the corner. They can be deflected. Some proportion of them will bounce off of a piece of material at an angle. But generally, that's considered perfectly sound protection for the entrance of a shelter. Well, in other words, the air isn't uh, polluted itself. No. It's only that if the rays coming out of this little, these little particles uh, when you're in direct, uh, direct line, line of, of those, line of and side. that's why you get that thickness of this wall plus the uh, cellar wall on the ground outside. Let me say a word about the air, Governor, because there's a wide misconception about that in many people's minds. Mm -hmm. uh, everyone thinks that air would be polluted you, if you breathed it, that you're therefore dead anyhow, so what's the use of worrying about it? That is not a fact. Uh, fallout can go through air and does because it's heavy. It's exactly like heavy dust particles. Heavy dust. Uh, it does not pollute the air. You can breathe the air with uh, just as much freedom as you do today. I think you ought to be careful if you're in an underground shelter where you must have an intake and an exhaust of air, perhaps to have a common ordinary filter in there to trap the particles should be so any less. So the particles don't come through, but the air is perfectly all right. That's right. The particles themselves are the danger in this point. Well, now, Keith, that looks pretty expensive to me. That well, shelter. that's not uh, very expensive. I can come to some costs on that, Governor, but that is the uh, older concept of a shelter where you build and the more comfortable one, and those who can afford it would like to have headroom and all the rest of it. Yeah. This idea came out of uh, 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 some of the thinking of the committee in this thing, and we think it's a pretty good one. This is what we call a compact shelter. It's about four and a half foot headroom. You can make it any headroom that you please. But we're still in the cellar. We're still in the cellar. It's important to have that in mind. The family is inside, again with a baffled door, of the yeah. same type that we had before. Yeah. Now, the beauty of this shelter is it can be made any length that you want, assuming that your basement will take it, of course. Sure. It can be made for two people, three people, four people, six people, whatever number that you need on it. You have ample room to lie down or sit up if you stay in this place for two, first two or three days, uh -huh. then the intensity will have gone down enough, radiation will have gone off enough, so that you can venture out intermittently into the outer basement space. Well, you're still some protected. You've still got some protection sure. there, perhaps nothing like what you had in here. Mm -hmm. You'd probably still sleep in here in order to spend as much time as possible in the more protected space. But you could go out, get some exercise, bring in some more food supplies, which you might have in the outer basement and so forth. But how, how would you tell when you could come out of these? Uh, well, you can tell very easily. Now, I've got a couple of little gadgets here, which uh, uh, show you need them. how you can do it. Here's a little instrument, which we call a personal dosimeter. Uh, that you wear like a fountain pen and carry it or have it in the shelter and put it on at the beginning of an attack. Yeah. That will register by looking through it here uh, what your intake is, in effect, from radiation, and give you the kind of warning that you know because your body acts somewhat as a reservoir for this. So, so I mean, that tells you how much... Uh, it tells you how much you have absorbed yeah. in radiation. This other little gadget, same size. And you know how much you can take so that you can tell from that whether you're getting too much. That's right, and it has a relationship to this. Yeah. This little gadget here you can hold out in the door or in the shelter or stick your hand out a window in the basement and it will measure the intensity of radiation at that point. And you can tell whether it's safe very, to come out? Very short exposure will not do you any damage, mm. particularly if your whole body is not exposed. Mm. That gives you a good clue as to what's going on outside. And well, then, are of these course, very expensive? No, we can... Uh, the manufacturer who manufactures this pair will mm. uh, sell them, I think, in the order of 5 to $7 a piece. So you mean this is getting within the range of everybody. And there are other manufacturers working on this thing now, and I'm sure by the time that uh, this program of ours gets in a, underway that uh, there will be uh, a good many on the market that are quite inexpensive. Well, Keith, if that's uh, if possible, now what about the cost of these shelters? Because it seems to me this well, is terribly important. Uh, these costs uh, are, are quite inexpensive. Uh, 
quite low, uh, Governor. Mm -hmm. uh, for a family of two, on the do-it-yourself basis, and these are common, ordinary building materials that I speak of here. Family of two, if the father has uh, little ability in this area, you can build that shelter, and we've priced it out all over the state, uh, for from 60 to $70. For a family of five or six, you can build a shelter of that type for from 115 to $125. Well, in other words, this, is, this now, is gonna be in the range uh, if you of everybody have, to uh, do, perhaps some who need financial help to get some help, but virtually everybody could build these or get some help to build them uh, within, their, within their means. Right. Now, of course, if you have a contract to do it, you feel you're going to drop one of these concrete blocks on your foot or something, rather, uh, or you prefer to have him do it, the cost will be somewhat more than yeah. do it yourself in the picture. But they're quite inexpensive, and it brings it down, Governor, it seems to me, into a range where uh, it's well within the reach of almost every person in the state, and we have provided in our report for uh, an appeals procedure uh, uh, for hardship cases, if there are any that can't well, handle the thing. Well, Keith, in other words, this thing can be done at costs. Uh, you've got the instruments. You'd have a radio in there, a transistor, say, to, 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 to listen and to know what was going on outside. You right. could detect how much radiation. You'd have your food. How, then how, how, what kind of a plan did you come up for the state as a whole? Because I know that people would like to know, those who haven't had a chance to see the report yet, what was the basis of your plan for the state as a whole, for the 16.5 million people? Well, Governor, we took advantage of the go-home time to suggest that all children from schools go home, if possible, and we think a very high percentage of them can in the hour, that all employees... You mean uh, those who lived uh, within, who a, lived an within an hour's distance could walk, walk home, or maybe a little running So they'd go you, back uh, to their family. So right, they'd be they'd with, the, with, with, the, with the mother. That's and correct. Well, that's terrible. And boy. that... Uh, Workers, employees, uh, likewise, would go home if it was possible to do so in the hour. Mm -hmm. We therefore centered this protection plan, the recommendation to you, on the home. Good. There are a lot of other reasons for that. Uh, fathers and mothers want to be with their children and vice versa in an well, emergency. And I think it's terribly important that that be so. Now, uh, with that plan, we have therefore concluded, and uh, I believe this firmly, that the only sensible thing to do the only sensible kind of insurance to take out against the lives of our children and ourselves uh, is to enact legislation for their health and safety and their welfare in this state. So that yeah. everybody in the state... That would, everybody would in the state is protected. And we therefore recommend that in all uh, uh, new structures built after uh, the 1st of January 1962 that they incorporate shelters and that for all existing structures, uh, whether residence or business, uh, include shelters in their total scheme of things, whether construction or not, and in many cases it will not require construction, because in many of the multiple families, uh, dwellings in, the, in our cities, apartment and uh, our apartment houses and so forth, there are now basements with adequate protection of this minimum 100 to 1, which we recommend in the report. Uh, that these existing structures, therefore, uh, include shelter areas, designated shelter areas or space, by July 1st, 1963. If we did that, Governor, I think we would provide the greatest insurance that could be provided for our people. So you mean by in three years from now, everybody, whether they're in their office, if they couldn't get home, they'd have it, or if they're in the factory where That's they were right. working, the school children that couldn't get home would have it, that everybody in the state, including the, every home, Right. would have this protection right. by uh, nine